episode of DBX Labs. Uh, we're going to make 5 amino tetrazole from amino guanidine bicarbonate. Um, and the way we're going to do that, I kind of went over in the last video, uh, we're going to do a diazination with sodium nitrite followed by a basification. Um, I'm going to use baking soda and um, uh, that's how we're going to uh, cyclize the amino guanidine um, into the 5 amino tetrazole. Um, get that tetrazole ring formed and from there we can make a whole bunch of other compounds. So here's the four uh, chemicals that we're going to need for this procedure. Um, baking soda for the basification, uh, the amino guanidine bicarbonate of course, um, and uh, hydrochloric acid to convert the amino guanidine bicarbonate into amino guanidine chloride which is a soluble salt in water that is, and um, sodium nitrite to do the diazination. Um, I forgot to mention that we will need to do a reflux for about two hours. Um, so I don't have a, um, a proper unbroken, um, distillation apparatus of this, at this moment. So I'm going to be using this, uh, air cooled, uh, reflux condenser that I, uh, happened to make by accident. Um, and we're going to need a hot plate, of course, uh, heat up the mixture. Before we move on, I would like to say that this is the procedure outlined by All Chemistry um, uh, in his video on um, uh, making amino guanidine by, uh, no, making 5-amino um, tetrazole from um, uh, amino guanidine bicarbonate. Um, the only difference in the procedure is instead of ammonia, 25% uh, ammonia solution, I'm using baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate. Uh, that's simply because I don't have 25% um, piss at my disposal right now, um, and uh, sodium bicarbonate works just fine, as long as you don't add too much, um, which I have done. It, it doesn't work if you add way too much baking soda because you have too much bicarbonate in in solution um, and um, yeah let's get cracking first we get our uh, 39 grams of um, amino guanidine bicarbonate Next we get our 42 milliliters of distilled water and we add them to the Erlenmeyer flask. I'm using a 250 milliliter one. And we add a stir bar of our choosing. We then measure out 32 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid. And we begin neutralizing our solution of the insoluble amino guanidine bicarbonate and water. Take this very slowly because it is a um, neutralization of a carbonate. And we should be left with a <clears throat> with the soluble um, ammonium chloride salt. Now we add in a second portion of 32 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid. 
this acidifies the solution and um, allows us to diazinate it once we add the sodium nitrite. We then prepare a solution of 21 grams of sodium nitrite and 44 milliliters of distilled water. We now prepare a cooling bath for our solution, um, turn it on high stirring, and set up an apparatus to slowly drip the nitrite solution into um, the amino guanidine solution, which is now entirely soluble and acidified. We now begin the additions of the nitrite solution into the amino guanidine solution. These additions should take at least 30 minutes to prevent the, uh, the release of large quantities of nitrogen oxides. Currently the temperature in the solution is 15 degrees Celsius. The reaction should never go above 25 degrees Celsius. Now that all the nitrite solution has been added, I'm going to let the solution sit, stir, um, sit and stir for 20 minutes at roughly 20 degrees Celsius. Um, it has to warm up a little bit before I start timing it, but um, after that, it should be basified by the sodium bicarbonate and then refluxed. So the solution has been running at about right around 20, 25 degrees Celsius uh, for about 20 minutes now. And um, nit nitrogen oxides have been evolved. Um, I do have some, uh, I do have some dilute um, nitric acid being absorbed into this damp paper um, right there. Um, I mean, dilute nitric acid forming right here. But uh, now, before we do the additions of the sodium bicarbonate, um, I'm going to do a pH test um, to see where we're standing right now. What I found from um, uh, from these uh, from the synthesis uh, after running it several times is. The tetrazole ring is, um, uh, once formed, it it has a it it doesn't break apart very easily. Um, it's fairly resistant to um, all ranges of pH, um, at least um, from what I've seen. Uh, I've I've added too much base. I've added too much acid in at times and. The, the uh, synthesis still works, so that that's good news, um, I guess. So right now, it looks like the pH is acidic, which which would make sense uh, considering we added all that hydrochloric acid in to begin with. And now we're going to. Do the additions of the sodium bicarbonate uh, very slowly, though, because um, there is a lot of acid in there, and once again, we're adding a bicarbonate to an acid. I'm using a straw to do the additions because um, I find that a straw cut like that works pretty well.
and yep, it's it's still neutral. So at this point, I'm going to um, uh, assemble the reflux apparatus, which isn't much of one. It's um it's a broken condenser. But it works just fine. I've, I've ran the synthesis with this a few times and gets the job done. solution has refluxed for right around two and a half hours at this point. I'm going to turn off the heat, uh, let the solution cool to the point where it's no longer boiling, and begin acidifying the solution to a pH of 4, at which point the synthesis is complete and the compound should begin crystallizing out shortly. The solution has now seized its boiling, so I will begin measuring the pH and adjusting it to a pH of 4. Looks like right now it's highly acidic. Now this is where the video might be a little bit different from um, some other Tetrazole videos you've watched. Um, in this video, uh, the pH is already acidic, whereas in most cases the pH is basic. So before uh, you click off this video and, and say, oh, you failed the synthesis. Um, I want to inform you that uh, the Tetrazole ring is highly uh, resilient to pH change. And um, the synthesis still works even if your pH turns out to be um, very low after uh, the reflux. So somehow um, the pH did drop during the reflux. Uh, I'm not sure what mechanisms uh, caused that, um, but there is still amino tetrazole in this uh, solution, and um, the yields I've gotten are identical to the yields um, that um, Engager has gotten, that, um, uh, not identical, but close, close enough to tell me that the synthesis isn't screwed over, so don't worry about that. Let me just um, adjust the pH accordingly to a pH of 4, um, since it is already too acidic, I'm going to use some more baking soda to bring it down, well, bring, bring it up in pH. And at this point, I, um, I've reached a pH of 4. And the solution um, can now cool, and we should see some amino tetrazole, five amino tetrazole, uh, starting to precipitate out. I'm gonna try to wash the residual um, uh, bicarbonate off the sides of the Erlenmeyer. Um, that way, it doesn't basify the solution as I'm pouring it into a, a beaker for it to cool in. I'm now going to pour the solution that has a pH of 4 into a uh, beaker and hopefully you should see some crystallization begin uh, shortly. get reacted with a little bit of bicarb that was on the side of the Erlenmeyer so let me check the pH you might have to adjust accordingly accordingly but um, it looks like the pH is still right around where it needs to be so we'll let it sit and hopefully in a couple of minutes it will start to crystallize because the solution is super saturated Now 
let's vacuum filter the solution. Here's the remaining solution that was filtered off the crystals. Uh, I can tell there's still quite a large amount of the tetrazole in there. Um, so I'm going to put this uh, flask in the fridge and let it cool down. Hopefully I'll get a considerable yield off of this as well. Here are the slightly yellow crystals that I got um, in the filtrate. They, um, the crystal structure is flat, and I can definitely see that um, in these crystals. Um, although it might not look like that from this angle. Um, you can definitely see the, the crystals are almost flaky um, in nature. Here's some of the crystals that I got from a previous run um, of the 5 of amino tet tetrazole. Um, it's just a few of them. This was the entire yield of that run, but um, I'll compare the, the burn tests uh, of both the dry and the wet uh, yields. Here's the wet. And here's the dry. With some of the wet product, we can try a contained burn test. But I've never gotten much more than that to ever happen. Though that, that is predictable considering that um, amino tetrazole isn't a very, um, uh, beyond uh, burning, uh, very well. It's not much of an energetic uh, chemical. Um, in order to get the truly energetic properties, you have to form salts that, instead of withdrawing electrons, donate electrons. Uh, so that's where you get the alkali metal salts, which are all explosive. In the direct flame test, the substance often burns better than if uh, heated from underneath. Next video, we will convert the 5 amino tetrazole into 5 nitro tetrazole and subsequ subsequently into um, any nitro, uh, sodium nitro tetrazole, uh, NANTS through a one-step reaction with sodium azide at 65 degrees Celsius.